Hi, I'm JC Vaughn for Scoop and the Phantom Advisory Network, and we're here talking to John Jackson Miller about the upcoming release, August 27th, of Star Wars Kenobi. John, what can you tell us about the book? It's 400 pages long. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, uh, Star Wars Kenobi is a book that I've wanted to write for a long time. It actually started as a graphic novel that I had pitched to uh, Dark Horse uh, some years ago, uh, and as I kept revising it and adding to it. It got so long, there was absolutely no way it was going to fit in a, a, a graphic novel. Uh, I, As luck would have it, last year I got a chance from Del Rey, Random House, to uh, write the novel uh, as a hardcover, uh, releasing August 27th. Uh, the book is set almost immediately after the end of uh, Star Wars Episode Three: uh, Revenge of the Sith. Uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi has uh, lost everything in his life. He's, uh, he's lost his friends. He believes he killed his best friend. Uh, he, you know, the Jedi Order is gone. The Republic is gone. Uh, the old hope has failed. Uh, the new hope is Luke Skywalker, and he has to uh, move to Tatooine, go into exile for who knows how long. He certainly doesn't know how long uh, to uh, you know, watch over him. And uh, so this presents uh, an interesting kind of a story to tell. Uh, Star Wars Kenobi, and here's the advanced reader copy, uh, is uh, really almost more of a Western. Uh, there are no lightsaber fights. There are no other people with lightsabers. All the other Jedi are gone. Uh, there are no large uh, space battles. Uh, the entire film is, the entire film, the entire movie uh, is set uh, in that area that we saw filmed uh, on Tatooine uh, in the desert. Um, yeah, and you know, since uh, Obi Wan is basically in witness protection, uh, he's actually protecting uh, Luke himself, Skywalker. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he absolutely uh, cannot go running around uh, doing the things that come naturally to him. So and helping so, people out. So, how long a period does the book cover? Uh, the book uh, takes place over actually it's a number of visits that Ben or Obi Wan uh, has with some of the locals. Uh, there's a local community that is uh, that is uh, presented in the story that I developed. Uh, you know, the uh, where he lives is a good long ways away from where Luke Skywalker lives. Uh, but he has to set up house. He has to, uh, you know, find where he's uh, you know moving to, uh, and he has to find some way of feeding himself uh, and and getting the water machine working and everything else, the vaporator, uh, and. Uh, as with any good Western, we have a, uh, a village. We have uh, villagers. We have, uh, you know, the the wise woman that runs uh, the local general store, who uh, has uh, suspicions that he's more than he seems to be. Uh, and also, as we all often have with uh, these kinds of stories, where there's a, a fish out of water, or you know, the stranger in the small town. Uh, you know, we have the 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 local uh, older male figure who is. Uh, you know, he's, he's, he's the landowner, the big operator in the region, uh, and uh, he befriends Obi-Wan Kenobi, but, you know, as we often see in, in Westerns, the main thing he wants to know is that the status quo is going to continue uh, and that the newcomer is not uh, a threat. Um, and then we have a, 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 another uh, you know, group of characters, the Tusken Raiders, uh, the Sand People, uh, and uh, this is one of the uh, one of the unusual things that we're doing with Kenobi is, uh, you know, we see Ben through the eyes of these other characters. Uh, you know, we do get some time with him alone, but most of it is them interpreting him and what he's doing through their own um, their own lens, their own viewpoint. And of course, there's some particularly unusual lenses uh, in the uh, the uh, in the in the uh, garb of the Sand People. Uh, the Sand People are as alien a group of characters as I've ever written. Uh, there really has not been a story before writing with uh, you know, a Tusken Raider's point of view. Um, certainly there have been other stories about the Tuscans and about people who come to live with them. Uh, but we, uh, in this, uh, you know, I got the chance to create a mythology uh, for the Tusken Raiders and how they are the way they are and why they live the way they do. Uh, and uh, in particular, uh, they're very miserable. They've been quite miserable for the last uh, two or three years because of what happened 
uh, in Attack of the Clones when Anakin Skywalker uh, you know, basically went nuts and and got medieval on an entire uh, you know sand trooper uh, 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 sand people camp, uh, and yeah, it, it is uh, it it's an interesting uh, thing to get to write these characters um, because you know while they are uh, you know pathetic, they're not pitiful uh, in the sense that we don't have pity for them because they do some really nasty things. Right. Uh, and so, uh, you know, but again, Obi-Wan understands that the truth uh, sometimes depends on your point of view, as he says in a later movie. Uh, there are little echoes here and there uh, uh, you know, about, uh, you know, what Ben does in other movies. Okay, let's jump back a little bit. You've, had, you've written two other Star Wars novels. One was a serialized uh, Lost Tribe of the Sith, and the other one was Knight Errant. Mm -hmm. But this is this, you know, along with your comic book Star Wars work, which you've had a lot of it. This is your first chance to play with the the main characters that we sort of grew up with. What, how did that, as a writer, how did that feel, and well, it, what, where did it take you? Well, it felt great. I I will say the the actual very first Star Wars story I, I got to do was an issue of Star Wars Empire, uh, and so oh, yeah, that's right. so it was yeah. a, it was a Darth Vader uh, detective story. Uh, but basically from there, I leapt immediately back into the far, far distant past. Uh, and yes, uh, you know, Kenobi is the first time I've gotten you know, this close to, to the, you know, the movie characters again. Um, you know, it, it, I will say that the connecting tissue between all of the works that I've done uh, is, uh, is a single question. Uh, what does it mean to be a Jedi alone? Uh, you know, in, in Knights of the Old Republic, Zane Carrick, uh, you know, he is, uh, he's an outcast. Uh, you know, uh, among the Jedi, uh, he's hunted, uh, and of course, then later on, he, he just becomes a, a vigilante on his own. Uh, you, you know, he, he, and yet he still uh, keeps to the Jedi tenets in his own way. Uh, Knight Errant, that's another situation where, uh, you know, Kara Holt uh, is cut off from the rest of the Jedi Order, uh, and yet still, you know, even though she doesn't have that infrastructure out there to, to you know, make decisions uh, for her, uh, you know, she still has to try to be her own personal Jedi Council and, right. and make the right decisions. Even Lost Tribe of the Sith, uh, you know, there's a, there's a passage in there where we have a single Jedi who is trapped on the planet of Sith, uh, of, of Sith uh, you know, natives. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think that that's something which in each of my stories, uh, you know, I've been playing with that uh, idea. What does it mean uh, for somebody who is, is basically... Uh, you know, a, 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 a ronin, a cut-off samurai, somebody who was away and apart from uh, the institutions. And, of course, the, there have been so many stories about the Republic, so many stories about the Jedi Order. Uh, these guys that I've written about are all on the outside. Uh, and, uh, and but, still trying, but still trying to live their lives a certain way. That's true. And, uh, you know, of, of course, the, you know, the thing we tempt Ben with in this is... Uh, could he live any other sort of life? Uh, because basically, you know, they, you know, they say ethics are what you do when no one's around to see. Uh, well, certainly nobody is around to tell Ben Kenobi that, uh, you know, uh, Jedi uh, can't date. Uh, nobody's around to tell <laughs> Ben Kenobi uh, anything other than uh, the Force. And, uh, you know, we, we, we do see him communing with that. And, and you know, certainly... Uh, you know, Ben is sort of working his way through uh, a puzzle here. How can he, uh, you know, commit to the mission that he has uh, and still live a life that is uh, has meaning for him day to day? Um, as someone observed uh, earlier, uh, there's some similarities to uh, the way he's portrayed in this and uh, the way, for example, Clark Kent. Uh, or Peter Parker is portrayed uh, in superhero comics. Uh, they're in their civilian identity often when they're doing their heroic things. Uh, they they cannot be seen to be doing what they're doing. Uh, and I think you know as soon as people read the prologue to this, they'll get a sense of how Obi Wan Kenobi is going to be heroic without running around with a badge on him saying, "Hey, look look at me! I'm a Jedi." Um, you know he's going to have to begin doing things. Uh, on the QT, on uh, he's going to have to begin doing things uh, undercover 
And it just so happens that he's a clever guy. So he's able to do that. It sounds great. Let's talk a little bit about about your serialized novel that's now being collected, and it's your or it's your original material. Why, why, I'm sure that some people haven't heard about it. Why don't you tell them? Uh, the uh, yeah, this is called Overdraft with the sub subtitle The Orion Offensive. Uh, I, I it is a it is a serialized uh, group of stories. It was originally presented as a Kindle serial, uh, published by Forty Seven North which is uh, the uh, fantasy and science fiction and horror imprint uh, for Amazon. Uh, and uh, you know, Overdraft takes place in the 22nd century. Uh, it's a time where uh, we have reached the stars and found that they're open for business. Uh, it, is, uh, it is a series which is uh, heavily immersed in trading and commerce. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the main character, actually there are two main characters, uh, one of the main characters uh, uh, Jamie Sturm is a, uh, a essentially a stockbroker. He's a he's a, a desk worker for an interstellar expedition. E expedition, uh, and uh, one day uh, while horsing around, uh, sort of like those uh, internet traders we hear about, the London Whale and those kinds of characters, he bankrupts his entire expedition, and the uh, the bodyguards, the mercenaries uh, that are out on the frontier, find out about this and. Uh, they decide they're not going to go quietly un into unemployment and they go back to the solar system and they grab him and they say, okay, we have a hundred days to get our hundred billion dollars back and you're going to get it for us in the most dangerous places to trade in the, uh, in, in the, uh, in, in the galaxy, in the, in the Orion arm of the galaxy that we can find. Uh, and so they, they, it is very much a situation where, where Jamie is the, is the reluctant trader uh, and his bodyguard, uh, a woman named uh, Bridget Yang, who has an armored group of mercenaries, they absolutely do not want this whiny guy with them, uh, but they're forced to work together and, uh, and uh, naturally they find a lot of surprises out there. But it's about to come out in print. Uh, what's the story there? That's right. Uh, it's coming out in print, uh, and uh, uh, the the collecting the, the the serialized uh, uh, you know work is actually a throwback to the old days. Uh, you know the uh, you know the early science fiction novels were actually not novels to begin with. Many of them, uh, like Isaac Asimov did, they were serials that ran in the pulp magazines. Uh, and of course, the pulp magazines went away, uh, but you know, comics sort of you know kept the you know the the fire burning for uh, for uh, uh, serialized fiction and cliffhangers and that sort of thing. Um, Amazon, since it has this ability to you know download directly uh, you know the the new episodes of of uh, you know prose stories to subscribers, um, you know they. Uh, decided to you know, begin working with some science fiction authors and horror authors and fantasy authors. And it's one of those things where I just looked at it and said, you know, having done so much work in comics over the years, I understand the form. I understand doing cliffhangers. Sure. I understand having a meta arc that all puts together into a larger thing. Uh, and so, yeah, this spring it, re it released, uh, you know, it's a complete length novel, but we released it uh, 12,000 words at a time every two weeks. Uh, and yes, now it is. Uh, it is going to be put together uh, in a in a completed work. Uh, my website, uh, farawaypress.com, has uh, the links to where you can find it. It is available uh, through uh, you know all the major you know book distributors, and cool. we're going to work on getting it diamond too. Very good. What uh, what else do you have coming up, and what can you tell us about what's coming down the road for you? I have a variety of uh, unusual things for me uh, because I uh, am focusing more on writing prose this year. Uh, I, I didn't pick up any you know, ongoing comic series, uh, but I have been doing some things here and there. Uh, over at Dark Horse, where I've done most of my comics work, uh, I actually have a Conan story coming up in, in Savage Sword number six. That's uh, Robert E. Howard's Savage Sword number six. And that is cool because it is uh, drawn by Philip Tan, uh, who was the artist on The Deep End, which is uh, one of the storylines that I did in the Iron Man run that I did uh, back in 2003, 2004. So that's the first time he and I are working together again. That's, that's in Savage Sword 6. I think that's coming out in November. Uh, and then also just announced uh, I am writing a Star Trek. Uh, I, uh, this is actually, uh, because it's all that would fit in my schedule, it's a, it, this is an e-book uh, uh, novella. Uh, for Simon & Schuster Pocket Books. 
Uh, and this is, uh, it is called Absent Enemies, and it is under the Star Trek Titan banner. Uh, Star Trek Titan uh, follows the adventures of, uh, he was once, uh, you know, Commander, now Captain Will Riker. Uh, you know, Riker uh, was, uh, you know, he's made Captain uh, in, you know, Star Trek, uh, the last Star Trek movie that came out with the Next Generation crew. Uh, Riker is uh, absolutely my favorite Next Gen character. Uh, and uh, in, in the Star Trek Titan stories, uh, he has teamed up with uh, his, uh, his wife, uh, Deanna Troy, and uh, also uh, as, as sort of his, uh, you know, uh, uh, right-hand thinking man assistant, uh, Tuvok. And Tuvok was uh, the, the Vulcan from uh, uh, Star Trek Voyager. Uh, this is the first chance I've had uh, to, you know, write, uh, you know, for, for Star Trek. Actually, you know, ironically, the very first thing I, I wrote, prose-wise, uh, the first pitch I ever had accepted, was before any of the Star Wars stuff. It was for a Star Trek ebook line that was unfortunately canceled after I sold my first story. <laughs> so it, it, we're kind of full circle back around to that, and uh, I hope to do more with that realm in the future. I feel obliged to ask, is there something about people with the initials JJ doing both? Star Trek and Star Wars. Well, that was what I said when I made the announcement: is that it's uh, uh, only Nixon can go to China. Only guys who have the initials JJ can write for both Star Wars and Star Trek. Actually, I don't think that there's a there's any sort of a you know animus between you know, the worlds at all, or and, and really even the fans. I mean, you know, we all like good stories and cool stuff. And uh, you know, if, if we were to go back in time and look at all the different crossovers, I mean, geez, you know. You know how, how, how much, uh, how many special effects did ILM, Industrial Light and Magic, do for the Star Trek movies? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, so, uh, so, yeah, that's, that's all good. And, you know, I'm, I'm working on, you know, plotting out the future for, uh, for Overdraft. Uh, and uh, I, have, I have some more, uh, some more of my own fiction that uh, yeah, I'm just waiting to get time to put it on the page. This is J.C. Vaughn for Scoop and the Phantom Advisory Network, live at Comic-Con.